we have uh, our panel on autism and AI. So this panel is going to be led by Alice Renard, who is the president of UCL's Autistic Society. Um, and we have a few other members. Uh, we've got Thomas Nayart, who was previously um, uh, presented previously. Uh, and we've got uh, Luke, Susanna, uh, Larissa, I believe, um, and Joe Mintz as well. So if everyone who is going to be on the panel can turn on their camera so that we can see you, that would be wonderful. Fantastic. Um, and thank you all very much for being here. Uh, we've had quite a lot of um, interaction from people and off from the very first talk with Marie and Thomas. So thank you for answering all the questions in the in the Q&A, Thomas. Um, so I think this is a, a subject that seems to be of interest to a lot of people. So I'm just going to hand over to Alice um, and let the panel begin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, so my name is Alice. Um, I'm a final year comparative literature student um, at UCL um, and I'm the founder and president of the Autism Society at UCL. Um, I, I thought we could start maybe with a round of introductions. Um, Professor Jomans, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us why you're interested in autism and AI? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm an associate professor at the UCL Institute of education. Um, so I was originally a, a primary school teacher um, and um, I was um, always uh, interested when I was working as a primary school teacher in terms of not really understanding whether, knowing whether I was doing the best for the, all the children in my classes and whether I was catering effectively for for, people, for children's different needs. So that's kind of what led me into uh, a career where I've been focusing on understanding about inclusion and special education needs and particularly uh, focused on autism education. And I've been doing work recently with uh, colleagues, uh, particularly Bill Lampos in uh, UCL Computer Science and other colleagues where we've been thinking about using machine learning um, for helping teachers in making strategy selections uh, in communicating with um, children with autism in the classroom. So see if we can use machine learning to uh, help teachers to better personalize the work that they do and meet the individual needs of children that they're working with in the classroom. Thank you very much. Um, um, Luke, uh, Ms. Shelley, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, um, my name's Luke. Um, I'm a second year medical student here at UCL. Um, there are three sort of main reasons why I'm really interested in this. Um, so firstly, like I said, I'm a medical student, really, really interested in mathematics, computer science and medicine. Hopefully I'm going to go on and specialise in that branch next year. And um, sort of associated with that is a lot of artificial intelligence. So I've been really interesting here, interested hearing about the developments um, in the previous talks. Um, secondly, I've got a public health sort of background experience. Um, I'm part of the NHS Youth Forum, which is an advisory group of young people, 14 to 25, who speak about NHS England strategy and youth services within the NHS. Um, so in that, I've got a lot of experience with social determinants of health. I, um, a lot of my time in the forum is taken up by looking at health inequalities. Um, so in particular, I'm really looking at, um, really interested in looking at how sort of the transition to a more digital healthcare system could um, be a really useful opportunity to start to try and tackle some of these health inequalities that we experience. So making sure that um, AI systems um, collect data very um, in a very inclusive and diverse way, um, and you know making sure that there's very good representation, which is why this panel is of real interest to me. And finally, um, I'm the brother of um, a low-functioning autistic um, child. Um, Leo is my brother. Um, and so I've got a lot of experience as a family member of someone with autism. So hopefully this sort of like medicine um, background, um, some public health background and autism background could be really useful in this panel. I did want to say there was an introduction that I'm not um, a member of the um, autistic community. I'm not neuro neurodivergent. So as I can speak for a like a family member of someone with autism, I've got a lot of experience with it. I don't want my viewpoint at all during the panel to be um, conceived as the viewpoint of someone who is autistic or neurodivergent. I'm going to let other people take that stance. But yeah, I'm very excited to speak. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, Susanna, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Hello, uh, my name is Susanna Chen. I use she, they pronouns. Uh, I am an autistic person from UCL Autism Society. I am a first year undergraduate student studying arts and sciences at UCL. Um, well, I don't have a lot of experiences with um, creating or studying AI, but I am interested in science policy and how the development of AI would affect myself and the actually autistic community. I am an autistic advocate. I've published many articles on neurodivergence and disability justice. Uh, I believe that um, technology and any kind of science or social work should be developed in consultation and uh, involvement of us and our community to really uh, reflect our needs rather than uh, neurotypical or non-disabled um, developers or even our family members and parents. So um, to support us and accept us instead of curing or treating our quirks. So um, yeah, I hope this panel can be a platform for me to sh share some of our voices. And I did some outreach within our community for their thoughts on this topic. So I'm really excited to share these later on. Thank you very much. Um, hi, Professor Larissa Suzuki, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Dr. Lara Suzuki. I, I head the AI and data practice at Google Cloud. I also work with NASA on the Interplanetary Internet Project. Uh, and I am a, an associate professor at UCL at University of Quebec and I also teach at Harvard. Um, I'm autistic myself. I have a lot of experience on autism. I was diagnosed very late in life. And um, for me, that was very impactful. And one of the things that I do today is to become an advocate for women with autism because women, they go under underdiagnosed uh, quite often and they impact their lives like pretty much once they are building themselves, becoming adolescent and also uh, in their adult life. Um, and that is pretty much about me. I have experience with AI and application of AI in medicine, uh, which is some of my background uh, when I did electrical engineering. And I, I feel like with AI, we can build uh, a better planet for everyone and to build inclusivity into our products and also to build technologies that can help autistic people to, uh, to navigate life uh, in a easier uh, manner. So yeah, that's about me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, um, Professor Thomas Mayart, would you like to introduce yourself again, please? Uh, hi again, for those who were uh, here before and, uh, and for who joined before um, just now. So I'm Thomas Mayer, I'm a member of the faculty of the School of Fitness and Management at the University of Geneva. And uh, I'm, my research is interest is in collective intelligence, uh, which happens to be uh, to be somehow related to the to the to the autistic um, realm. I would say uh, I have I must make a disclaim, disclaimer a bit like Luke. I have uh, actually uh, no autistic uh, trait uh, as much as I know, and um, and I'm not a clinician. Um, so I have pretty much agnostic uh, view, and actually uh, I must say I'm quite. Uh, I, I don't know much about uh, about autism beside the technically the technology we develop with uh, with Professor Marisha. So just please, if I make any misstep during the panel, uh, please forgive me already. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Um, so the first question is for Professor Joe Mins. Um, would you like um, to um, sort of give us details about um, what your work and research consists in and um, what's your approach and what methodologies you are using and how you think this um, will contribute to helping um, autistic children and adults? Sure. So. Um... What we've been looking at is um, how teachers uh, communicate with uh, autistic children in the in the classroom, and um, one of the the questions in 
autism education uh, is what might be the most uh, effective way that uh, would help uh, different children um, who are neuro neurodiverse um, with communication. And in terms of educational practice, um, um, and particularly we're working with children who are um, um, <coughs> pre-verbal um, or have um, limited verbal communication skills. Um, and we've particularly been working at looking at children um, who are catered for in, in, in special schools, though our work is also, also relevant to children in, in mainstream schools as well. And um, so we, what we look at is in terms of practice, teacher practice, so the things that teachers might use as well as verbal communication, they might use, might use visual communication, they might use gestures, they might use objects, <clears throat> they might use physical prompts where you might guide a child's hand, for example, in, in, in helping them to, to, to uh, complete a task. Um, and what we're looking at is if we can do some structured observation of interact of these interactions and the way that teachers interact in the classroom and collect enough data where you could where you essentially you can classify well there was this teacher interaction happened and this is what the this is the way that the teacher the type of communication type that the teacher used and this was the outcome <clears throat> in terms of was it a positive communication that led to learning or not um, if we collected enough data on that, so a whole series, basically what we do is we do uh, either by direct observation or video observation, if we collect enough of that data and we develop a machine learning function, would that be able to predict, to say, well, with a particular child, with particular characteristics in a particular teaching situation, this type of communication is likely to be more effective. And it's not about trying to replace teachers with um, with technology, it's saying that, well, if we were able to create a function like that, would it give some additional useful information to teachers? Would it be an additional source of information that might help them and allow them to incorporate that into their reflective practice and help them to make more effective decisions, which would be more helpful in terms of helping children with autism uh, in the classroom with their learning. And it's that quite an exploratory stage. So we've kind of done one round of data collection um, <coughs> um, and created an initial function. And now we're at the, we're just embarking on collecting a, a bit of a larger set of data to kind of refine some of our, some of our, our, our ideas. And, and this does link into kind of broader work in terms of AI. You, the use of, of AI machine learning in particular in terms of professional interactions. So there's other work that's going on looking at whether you can use AI in relation to professional interactions. So that might be, for example, with, in speech, with a speech therapist working with a client. It might be around <coughs> a, uh, a psychotherapist working with a kind in in therapy, so not you know, not necessarily related to autism education, but just more broadly, there's kind of quite a bit of interest in saying, well, can we use AI in terms of developing or giving more insight into professional interactions in the caring services? So it kind of fits into that kind of broad trajectory of work, um, and I do think it, it you know, as it, 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 there are also some kind of ethical issues that are involved um, <clears throat> that are raised by by the project so you know we're we're working as i say with children who are <clears throat> who are uh, pre-verbal or minimally verbal um and there's a question of well how can we involve them effectively in how can we include their voice and the voice of their parents in the work that we're doing um, and that's a difficult question to answer, um, but I think then it kind of links into other areas of research. I think there's particular interest in terms of research methodologies, in terms of how we can include the the voice of 
uh, children, autistic children and other children with uh, learning difficulties in this kind of research. Um, so it kind of raises the question. I don't think we've really answered them in, in the work that we're doing, but it certainly raises those questions. And I think that's kind of a kind of interesting question in the context of the, the debate, the, the, the discussion so far today and the, the, the work of this group is kind of well, how, how can we make sure that we were we would be able to include those those perspectives, I think is, is something that's important for us to think about and you know I kind of note it as an issue for the panel. So there we go. Thank you very much. Um, Luke and um, Susanna, um, based on your personal experience, um, how do you think this could help? And what do you think um, it might be missing in education to support um, autistic children and um, later on sort of adults? Sorry, that's, is that for me at all? Um, for Luke and Susanna. All oh, right, sorry, sorry. sorry. Susanna, would you like to go first? I'm happy to, if not. Uh, uh, sure, I can go first. Um, I, I found assistive technology is really helpful for my studies. Uh, for example, I use a text-to-speech software to help me with um, lengthy text. I find that um, I understand um, much better and quicker. And um, also, on the other hand, I also use a speech-to-text software to help me take notes because Processing all this um, Tory information sometimes isn't very easy. And um, also many autistic people I know share that they really think um, AAC, which is uh, alternative and augmentative communication technologies, uh, really help them to express their thoughts, um, especially for non-speaking autistics. And um, this is not really directly related to education in particular, but I think something will really be helpful is um, something that helps with daily tasks um, like autonomous vehicles or smart appliances because um, some of us struggle with tasks that neurotypicals might find easy, like driving, um, which is something I'm really scared of myself. <laughs> I don't have the driver's license yet. And um, I think having these technologies can really help us um, transitioning into and kind of um, sustaining independent living. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Luke. Amazing. Um, yes, it's sort of building on from a lot of points that Susanna said as well. I think one key point that um, AI um, could really, really prove vital in for children with autism is engagement. Um, so I know, say, for example, my brother, um, you know, put someone in front of him, he won't be that engaged, but put a, like an iPad in front of him, he would honestly be engaged for hours and hours and hours. So I basically think that AI systems and technological systems could help both in education, but also in healthcare, which is one of my backgrounds in um, sort of facilitating um, to get kind of more information and to be more engaging for individuals with autism. So in a healthcare setting, maybe using diagnostic tools, um, utilizing some of these technological systems as well, like, um, you know, diagrams or um, interactive um, sort of animations and that kind of thing could really, really help. And I also think in an educational setting as well, that will be of great value. Um, I also think um, autism is an incredibly individual disorder and actually that individuality could be reflected back with AI systems. You've got a lot more, um, a lot more receptive basically piece of technology than you would necessarily with um, an individual teacher who might be so stretched and not have the time to actually get to know all the individual um, interests of an individual with autism. So I found with my brother, he's so much more engaged by teachers and faculty who have showed an interest in what he's interested in. But actually, you know, the reality is that he's in an um, incredibly lucky situation to be in a school that's incredibly supportive. And actually, in different schools, different educational settings, you might not have teachers who are not only um, experienced with how to um, work most effectively with an autistic child, but also you might not have teachers who have necess necessarily have the time to be able to engage properly with an autistic child and to adapt systems to meet their needs most. So I feel like AI um, could have that receptive element as well, sort of feedback at what the child is most interested in, most engaged in, maybe even sort of um, when does the child understand the concept best? You know, what um, certain system does the child receive information best through? Um, so again, that sort of receptive element of it will be really good. And I also think having said that, 
um, you know, it might be more effective than having direct communication. I also think that in an educational setting, you could facilitate communication through AI systems. So again, you know, um, giving maybe a platform to, especially from a younger age, try and engage in um, social interactions on a screen and a less sort of, um, I know lots of people would find um, on technology, um, social interaction a bit less intimidating at first, basically, before you move this into a um, kind of face-to-face -face interaction. So actually using AI to sort of maybe mimic some social situations as well, um, to especially at a young age, try to engage children in this. Um, so I think in those three ways, these systems could really, really help. Um, I reckon in terms of uh, what's missing in education to support autistic individuals, which AI could support, again, it's that individuality that I mentioned, um, and also um, being receptive, basically, to learning. And I think in that way, AI can really target it. But just like, you know, it's been mentioned many times with AI, the key is basically having the data and being inclusive and diverse when you're actually seeking out how to develop these AI systems. So making sure that at all stages of the process, there's communication between the neurodivergent community um, and researchers, basically, because um, ensuring this will basically ensure that we don't have a repeat of um, the healthcare inequalities and social determinants of health that are still present in so many of our healthcare systems at the moment. You know, we've got a real opportunity here to make this as inclusive and diverse as possible. And I think that communication aspect, like we're doing now, um, is absolutely fundamental to this. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, Professor um, Lara Suzuki, um, how do you find holding such an important role um, in research? And how has your own um, neurodiversity helped you or held you back um, during your studies and your career? Well, uh, in my case, I find that being autistic has been very um, good and bad for me. So during my, during my life, my early life growing up, uh, it was quite difficult. I was bullied a lot. I, had, I spent my school years hiding in the bathroom because people wanted to beat me up and uh, because I was different. And I never understood why I was different. And despite trying to mask and mimic to try to fit in, it was really exhausting. And I never, I never managed to, uh, to do uh, as such. And when I was a kid, there was no diagnosis for people like me, especially because I'm a girl. And I was one of those autistic kids who did not have any coping mechanism, making me a very vulnerable pe person. And for many years, I had to suppress self-coming, repetitive movements, fake a smile in an environment that I found uncomfortable or distressing. And the hardest part has been not being able to read people's intention nor to pick up the cues, especially social cues. And that made me a victim of, of bullying and violence which was not very good. And I'm still a victim of that, even in adult life. And despite the social difficulties experienced by many neurodiverse people, we often display complex collaborative and supportive behavior while working in projects. Because our brains are wired differently from our neurotypical people, we bring new perspectives to a company's effort to create and recognize value. So I believe that my autism made me to be very focused on engineering, which is one of the things that I love doing. And my expertise, I, I'm a technical person, so I have technical expertise in AI, which is one of the things that uh, drives me, drives my role. And I think my autism helped me to be more aligned with, uh, with w what I wanted to accomplish and be very interested and focused uh, on, on, on what I wanted to accomplish. I have uh, ADHD comorbidity, so my ADHD made me to be thousand kilometers an hour doing gazillion things at the same time but my autism helped me to be focused on on a single area and kind of focus and do that very well um I, i'm not gonna say that this has been easy so one of the things for me was in my life that i learned is that i need that instructions are concise and specific I need to regularly have my re performance review. I, I tell my manager to not wait for a month for us to talk. It has to be more frequent because for me it's less distressing. Uh, the other thing for me that I learned in my career and in my life was that I need to receive direct feedback, but at the same time since people have to be sensitive because I was victim of bullying and most of the people with autism have been victim of bullying or violence sometime in their lives. So be very direct, but also take into account that some people have been bullied. So ensure that any criticism is sensitive and give positive feedback whenever possible. 
And the other thing is like preparing for changes. I'm someone that is, I find very difficult to deal with change and I need to be given some notice so that I can adapt and see how I'm gonna operate in a changed environment. And also I have sensory distractions. Uh, I have sensory issues. So I have like issues like with my hearing, with my sense of taste and smell. And I need to have some certain accommodations for me to be able to operate and to work. So I have to use noise cancelling devices. Otherwise, I cannot uh, operate uh, to the best of my ability. Um, so at some part of my life, like I, I spent like with a lot of struggle, but I think it was my autism who pushed me forward in my career to make sure that I became an accomplished engineer um, working at the forefront of AI and contributing to AI, uh, to the technical part of AI, that is how to make that technically to work and how to make sure that it's understandable, it's usable, and it can solve real problems um, that we see um, happening in the environment. So I think that in a balance of probabilities, I think that my autism has been more positive to me than anything else um, than uh, negative. So that is kind of my experience so far. Thank you very much. Um, um, Thomas Mayard, um, Larissa mentioned um, masking in autistic females. Um, how do you think your current uh, work and research could um, help diagnose females, especially older females um, that tend to mask more than uh, young autistic males? your question that is um i think the um mary already responded a bit of uh to to your question in the presentation sense that actually we the the the, the cohort we are we've been using for training our ai was actually pretty much well balanced in the in the um, uh, uh, on 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 sex and gender so it was really quite uh, uh quite I mean, quite, we found that it was robust, so the detection was robust for, uh, uh, across sex, so it's quite quite good, I would say. Uh, means that our approach could be could be uh, equally helpful for uh, for uh, for female and male. So that's what we 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 were quite positive with that. We also know that in our research we have so, there's some kind of a, a limitation, I would say that. Uh, that the EDOS we know has been developed uh, primarily for males. So actually, when you do the, the diagnosis, we know that this uh, this this EDOS uh, these questions actually are uh, already kind of biased uh, uh, towards male. And even with that, uh, we actually found that uh, it was uh, it was good for for predicting autism in in uh, in uh, for females. So I think it's kind of good good news. But we want to go further. Um, uh, for a matter of time, I don't want to share another slide, but we. We, with the skeletons, we we actually started to develop ways of um, making some kind of scene reconstruction. So it means that you have the you, you have the skeleton, and what we want to do is actually to rebuild some uh, some uh, some avatars in in uh, virtual reality for the uh, for reconstructing scenes. Why do we want to do that? Is that we know that actually um, uh, clinicians they are highly biased. So let's say you get a you you uh, you go for a diagnosis and uh, and uh, if the kid is actually a, a girl or, 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 or um, um, uh, a male, it would be actually the, 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 the clinician is going to see the is going to probably have a bias in a, in, a, in, a, in a diagnosis. So what we want to do is actually to rebuild some scenes uh, out of our skeletons in ways that we can uh, we can test and control for for diff different perceptions. So imagine you could take the same scene. And uh, in one setting, it's actually with a, with a male kid, and another one would be actually with a, with a, with a female kid, a preschooler. And that's uh, some kind of manipulations we want to do, first for, for further testing the reliability of our approach, but also to train the, 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 the clinicians to actually you know, be more sensitive to, to this difference of uh, uh, between uh, between female and male, so that's kind of things we have in uh, we have in mind. Regarding the age, it's a bit complicated to to answer because we really want to focus on early age because we know this is when we have uh, uh, there's good chance to actually 
provide um, uh, a, a good service to the to the to the to the um, to the people so with uh, with autistic uh, kids, especially when we were talking. Joseph was talking about education. I think it's uh, the the earlier we we people get conscious of the of of being autist, the better, and it's also good for the environment. So. We've, we've been working with uh, with parents of uh, autistic uh, uh, persons and also autistic uh, persons um, on the on our trying to make sure that our design and, uh, and our technology is good for for use and what we realize is that actually um, uh, uh, the um, the environment is important so you get a, you get a person an autist person and uh, the the whole environment has to to adapt in a uh, in, in a way that is uh, that should be coherent and coordinating between teacher between parents between between clinician if needed and this is something that at the moment is not is not necessarily working well so i think larissa was talking about having this uh, this uh, self-contained or, or predictable environment and this is something that we care about um, and uh, this extends directly from our research in, in ai we, we we became conscious that when we actually are going to deploy ai uh, for for diagnosis or for helping intervention, uh, uh, taking into account this environment and making sure it's uh, it's coherent for the for good for the kid is going to be extremely useful. Thank you very much, um, Luke. Earlier you mentioned that uh, you think it's really important for um, the sort of dialogue and communication between. Um, people working on AR tools um, and the neurodiverse community. Um, do you have any particular ideas of how this could be achieved? I reckon panels like this are a really good way to do it. You know, just getting people who, um, getting people who have lived experience of autism and also people who don't, because I think um, basically bridging the gap between that is really useful. I think in an academic and research setting, this becomes even more important. For researchers doing work in this sense, I, I believe that um, you say, for example, if you're trialing AI systems that aren't to do with autism, say, for example, you're just trialing a generic AI educational um, tool to include people who are neurodivergent in that um, basically population study to sort of test its effectiveness. I think that's something that historically within healthcare has led to, um, well, historically within healthcare and also just sort of a development of lots of different technologies. Um, has led to systems that don't work as effectively for um, a wide range of individuals. Um, so I believe adequate representation within sort of study groups and population groups are really useful. Um, and yeah, again, um, sort of trying to increase representation within. Um, obviously, you know, you can have um, representation within study populations, but actually trying to increase representation um, within academic institutions, basically, as well, um, to have voices sort of on um, the same level basically and people at the forefront of designing these technologies as well who have lived experiences of them um because at the end of the day um they're the people who can articulate their viewpoint best and who know exactly what these systems need in order to be adapted most effectively thank you very much um if um, there's any questions please um feel free to ask them in the q a section or um in the chat um, right. So I have a I have a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really enjoying the panel. Um, so yes, please do put any questions in the Q and A. Um, it, obviously, it's very important that we do have people involved in this population studies that you were talking about and getting autistic people involved. And I, it's fantastic to see so many people who've stepped forward from. Um, for this panel who are part of that community but obviously um Larissa talked about being bullied and I'm sure that um the, uh, I saw a lot of nodding heads from people uh, when she was talking about that journey how how engaged do you think um uh people are from the autistic uh from the autistic community who would want to be part of these population studies if they've had an experience of being bullied for being different do you think it's going to be um harder or easier uh, uh can you step forward yourself it's you know obviously very brave um i think i've probably put this to susanna because you've had a lot of feedback from people um but yeah how 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 engaged do you think the autistic community will be in population studies for ai uh if their history has been one of being othered or 
or bullied for being different? I think um, the autistic community in general is very, um, very willing to be engaged in AI. And especially I talked to someone who actually did her PhD in computer science at UCL. And um, there's a problem that I think autistic people are labeled as like technophobes when we speak out about any of our concerns about whether uh, intervention, we think intervention is harmful for us. Like um, the Applied Behavioral Analysis Therapy, ABA, um, it, it's one of the most common interventions out there, but it, it kind of, um, it forces us to conform to like um, a social, expectation and it increased the likelihood of PTSD and suicidality and um, but we are kind of suppressed and ignored when we speak out about that and any sort of technologies that are promoting um, us to conform to these expectations so um, I think there is an aspect of people trying to suppress um, our voices even though we're very keen to speak out. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, you've uh, spoken about conformity. Um, can you also relate to the um, to what um, Larissa said about masking um, and late diagnosis? Um, conformance. Uh, I think for me, uh, the way I mask is trying to emulate the way other people speak, and um, which leads to a lot of extra um, extra thoughts and about, oh, oh is this um, what they think I should see, I should be like? Um, did I say the right thing? Did I, did I do this at the right time? What if I'm too annoying? That kind of thing. But um, when, as we, um, as we grow up doing that, we become better at it, which is um, not really a good thing. It suppresses who we really are and leads to a lot of mental health problems later on when we um, mask too much. And also um, when we mask too much, we are not recognized by um, society to be their stereotypical autistic person, which leads to late diagnosis. And yeah, I think that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, um, so the pandemic, uh, a lot of things have had to be moved online um, and have happened digitally. Um, anyone in the panel, feel free to answer. Um, do you think this could actually help the autistic community um, in engaging in, for example, lectures and education and socializing? Um, I think I think one way in which um, it might help from my experience with sort of seeing family members move to sort of online education and stuff like that is a, a sort of giving an extra element of flexibility. You know, there's, there's very um, sort of definitely before COVID um, academic timetablings, time just general timetabling, time tabling, sorry, uh, was very, very rigid. Um, and I feel as if sort of moving online um, I'm not sure about other people's experiences, but my university course at the moment is very self-paced, you know, in terms of like lots of asynchronous content, lots of content where you can work your own way through, um, will give basically the opportunity to not only sort of adapt to maybe when individuals work their best, but also to um, kind of create a bit better a work-life balance as well, um, which might be useful as well. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, Sorry, Alice, just to, so can I just add to that? Because I mean, I know that's, it's a really interesting comment um, from Luke in relation to higher education. I think there has been, uh, in terms of school, school education, there's been quite a bit of um, both research and also um, R reports in 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 media and, and just generally within the teaching community and I think also within the uh, the autistic community particularly parents of children with autism about real concerns about how there has been a potentially for some children a really negative impact in terms of 
the move to online learning and how that that's for for for, for some autistic children that that's been been really really difficult, um, particularly in terms of disruption to to routine, not having the kind of um, safety and comfort which comes with the ability to be in school as well as being being at, at home. But but you know I think also kind of like you know. It, in terms of what Luke was saying, you know, you know, um, every child is different. So I think the, what you were saying about that ability to pace and to be able to review material. So you know, I, I think it's also probably possible that for, for quite a number of of, of children that there, there could have been some some benefits as well. So, so just to kind of comment on that from the school perspective. Thank you very much. Um, so there's two questions. Um, the first one was in the chat, um, again for you, um, Professor Jomans. Um, Susanna mentioned ABA. Um, does the work that schools um, are doing at the moment, um, is it working towards recognising the individuality of autistic, or does it look more to conform towards um, neurotypical individuals, neurotypical individuals? So, um, so I think first in terms of um, of, of ABA. So, um, although um, there is um, use of um, ABA in in England, um, it's it's generally much less uh, commonly used as an approach uh, than in many other territories, particularly compared to to the US and, and many uh, some European countries, so it's not it's not really used so extensively. It's much more common to see things such as teach, which is uh, a kind of more holistic approach to autism education coming out of the University of North, North Carolina uh, originally. Uh, so just to well, I was going to make that broad comment, but yeah, but I mean I think that that. Uh, issue that Susanna raised, I think, is a really important one. So the extent to which we're aiming to change the environment to suit the individual needs of the child, as opposed to bluntly changing the child to, 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 to fit the environment is kind of a, a key, a key issue and debate in terms of um, policy and practice within education and there are complex debates and 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 views about it um so um yeah and i think it i think i think for teachers this is something that they kind of grapple with all the, all the time um in the work that they do that they're, they're doing and thinking about inclusive practice um with it within the classroom um and you know um how where is there a where do you where do you draw that 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 balance i don't think it's a question with any easy answers and as i say you know people have strong views on different sides of the debate thank you very much um so there's been a reaction um in uh, the chat uh from christina who says uh, we have a four-year-old son with down syndrome and have been able to access early intervention from Bradford that we would never have had in Cumbria had it not been for lessons being now accessible um, via Zoom. Um, so I guess I would go in the sense that um, the pandemic has, um, in a way, um, helped um, make support more available and accessible uh, for people. Um, is there any other questions uh, for the? I have I have another question. Sorry, uh, uh, a privilege, I guess, of being a host. Um, this is actually more for Thomas. Um, so my eldest child is autistic, but he was not diagnosed till quite late, till year seven. Um, so I think actually, from Joe's point of view, if if there were things in place in the primary school, I think he would have done a lot better. Um, but uh, one thing. Here's what you would call considering very high functioning. So what we've got a lot from particularly other parents if he doesn't look autistic, it doesn't seem, you know, but he can do this, therefore why is he, et cetera. But we noticed from a very young age, he couldn't cope very well in restaurants. So if you put him in a restaurant, um, I guess all the noise, all the sound, all the smell, he would just slip off the chair all the time. He'd always just fold over himself. He couldn't sit in a chair or just normally sit in a chair. 
until, and this sort of comes back to what Luke was saying about um, laptops and iPads, um, we gave him something else to focus on. Uh, and even now at 14, you know, being on his phone is what calmed him. And he's just constantly playing games and having to see things move. And it really does help calm him down. And I guess there's a societal pressure of, um, of from other parents of, you know, you know, he's on a screen too much and you don't know where that to draw that line as a parent. But from your point of view, where you're doing your research, um, your environments are quite controlled, uh, it, it would seem. Obviously, I can only see people moving around on the screen. Do you do additional um, testing where you have uh, other senses that could be stimulated at the time that the child's in the room? Because for me, that was a perfect moment, which would really show that my son was having sensory overload in a situation and we couldn't work out why until later when we collected the dots went, ah, this would be part of his autistic journey. So when you're doing that with young children, um, do you do that? Do you include other sensory stimulation in the room or is it just two grown ups? you know, blowing bubbles. Bubbles, by the way, would send him crazy. Um, but I think that's with any two-year-olds, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, so what additional um, sensory stimulation do you do within your um, research uh, to see how that affects the interaction between children? Well, Sarah, this is a, an excellent question. I'm going to do try to do my best answering. First, in the research we've been conducting, we really use scenes of... Uh, of EDOS uh, diagnosis. So it lasts for one hour, it's pretty much controlled and standardized. Uh, the exercises are always the same. And, uh, and for now, this is it. Now, I think it also relates to a question by Joseph in the, in the chat that I realized I should have replied, but I think I take the opportunity now. It's actually, uh, okay, what do we, what, what can we do next with this kind of AI? Do we just do AI with the, uh, you know, uh, with with some videos of uh, of an EDOS diagnosis, this is just not so useful if you think about it, uh, because we would just have people. The clinicians are here around; they are anyway doing the, the 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 test, and then they come up with diagnosis. So I think the next step is actually all this AI can just go in the wild or in semi-controlled environment that can actually help um, that can help um, maybe the parents or maybe at school in other places. Um, and then uh, at this stage, you have two, you have two issues. Uh, and one is the one you're actually addressing, but I want to address the first one is actually uh, when we were thinking of all this, when this, all this AI is going to go in the wild, what do we need to do? So what we are thinking of at the moment is actually to develop some scripts uh, for the parents to play with the kids. So let's say you have one parent who is uh, taking a video, the other play parent is actually playing, a, playing, a, playing with the kid. And, um, and they're going to be a scene. But then we, we don't want to make it like completely open. We want to have like semi, um, uh, semi design script. And we, I mean, our vision is that probably in the future, we, uh, I'm not a clinician, but let's say the, the, the Mary's uh, uh, team, they would come up with some scripts, but we could imagine that in the future, the parents, uh, they could actually come up with new scripts that are more uh, that are more tuned to actually what they think is could be could be uh, discriminating or be useful for their for their kids. And this is actually where where actually your question comes in because very 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 often we when we hear uh, parents of autistic kids say, yes, but you know my, my the situation with my kid is special and so on. Of course, every situation is special. There's something very individual with the with the situation, and. Um, you know the, the 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 clinicians. There's there's so much they can do to customize, but what we but the parents, if they are given the the the, the tools to set up the proper setting to elicit what you know what could be detected or not by by an AI, that could be really cool. We would just go towards something that we could call uh, you know personalized uh, precision in intervention intervention in quotation mark because you could even think that it's not intervention. It's just also maybe about better understanding the environment of the kid. So I hope it, uh, uh, it answers your question. I, I know I was not directly answering on, on iPads and screens because actually it's a, yeah, it's a question that beyond, goes beyond my, my expertise, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, could I just add one thing there? Would that be all right? Yeah, of course. So I, I think, uh, just one thing to to add. I mean, so I think you know, I think diagnosis is, it can be extremely uh, important. Um, 
in, in many, many contexts. But within, within school-based education, um, you know, there's a real question as to what's the relationship between diagnosis and pedagogy, a pedagogic practice, i.e. in that it's, you know, it's not necessarily that having a diagnosis of autism or ADHD, et cetera, et cetera, is going to tell a teacher anything useful per se that from the diagnosis about this is what the pedagogic needs of an individual child are. It's much more about understanding that child as an individual and their and their specific individual needs and then thinking about what pedagogies might apply to those it's not as though there's necessarily a set of pedagogies which sit in, directly in relation to autism or adhd or or anything else so um so that's not to say that diagnosis isn't, isn't important but it, it its role in in, in school-based education is, you know, is, is more contested. Thank you. Um, Luke, is there anything you'd like to say? Yeah, I was just going to build on um, from your point. I think it's a really good point um, about sort of individuality and trying to appreciate that. I reckon sort of to build on it in terms of the um, importance of diagnosis, I think, again, it comes back to an individuality sense that even though some you know, um, individuals might feel as in, uh, maybe this isn't from the teacher to individual uh, pupil level, but more from the people just themselves holistically, even though some people might not feel like educationally their diagnosis would matter, they need to be treated as an individual. Actually having that diagnosis opens so, so many doors in terms of educational opportunities, but also in terms of social opportunities, you know, um, some people will find um, a diagnosis of um, autism will open up a whole new community, basically, of um, other pupils, other sort of educators who are maybe on the spectrum. Um, so I just think, you know, um, diagnosis, just like, again, building on the individuality point, it, it's basically the key to any point that it comes with autism, I think, um, that, you know, the level of diagnosis and the um, the importance of diagnosis in an educational setting and in a more holistic setting for the individual would vary massively. Thank you very much. Um, so we're now towards the um, end of the panel. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. It was really interesting um, having the point of view of both uh, researchers uh, and people who have personal experience um, of uh, autism and interacting with um, autistic children and adults. Um, if you have questions, feel free to write them down and put them in the chat or um, in the uh, Q&A uh, function. Um, I will let um, Sharon introduce the next speaker now. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panel members. It was really um, wonderful to have you all here and to hear your different viewpoints. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a parent of an autistic child, so it's it's always fantastic to hear voices of people who um, are doing so well in their studies or are doing so well in their professions, but also great to see that research is being done to help because I think if any other parents of autistic children are on, on today, they will know that the road to diagnosis can actually probably be, be one of the hardest and most painful. Um, so the idea that things can be done at a much younger age and that I think also that autism isn't meant to be the scariest thing that people I think used to think that it was. But if, if it's diagnosed early, interventions can be put in place, schools can adapt accordingly, we can use the tech to do so, that it's not this scary thing that I think a lot of people, a lot of people used to have when, uh, when you first hear the word your child is autistic or you worry about it. So thank you very much. This has been a wonderful panel. Um, there's a lot of... Um, a, a lot of thanks uh, in the chat as well from people saying thank you and really enjoying the discussion. 